Warning, the following video contains explicit language which may be offensive to some viewers or inappropriate for children. The content within this video is intended for mature audiences only. Hello and welcome to this video. Today's video is going to be Season 1, Episode 9. This is the first part. This is probably going to be a four-parter because this particular episode is about an hour long. And this is going to be a four-parter. I believe the next one, the the season 10 or the episode 10 is a little over an hour so like an hour and two minutes or something like that maybe two seconds I don't know it's just barely over an hour so these next couple episodes are going to be have more parts to them than normal so without further ado let's get into it how would you know to leave me a message here? Last episode, after beginning a discussion about the Berenstain Bears and his theory about the children of one particular Gatewick Institute study acquiring the ability to slip dimensions during moments of extreme stress, Jones finally told me the story I'd been asking him about. The reason he'd been sent away, or as he put it, thrown away by his parents when he was a kid. He told me it was because he'd burned down his entire town. I asked him what he meant by that, if it was some kind of metaphor. But he told me it was no metaphor. It was fire. His family had been living on a small island in Washington State at the time, a short ferry ride from Seattle. He and his best friend had been working as dishwashers in the island's only restaurant. When Jones overheard his parents talking about separating, he started acting out. And yeah, Jones... Jones has a troubled childhood. Just, you know, if you haven't figured it out by now, yeah, he has a fairly troubled, troubled childhood. Yelling at his mother, staying out all night, stealing cars, and eventually lighting fires. One night, after everybody had left the restaurant, Jones sat a can of kerosene on the stove, turned on the burner, and left. Yeah, that's not signs of a really stable mental facilities at that point. Your, your brain is kind of out there at that point. The can exploded in an unforgiving spray of liquid fire. Now, what's funny about that is, or not funny, what's interesting, what, what it caused to my mind, I should say, better say, is that if you've ever thrown like a spray paint can or something in a fire and it combusts and shoots out like a rocket, that's kind of what that kind of, I kind of envision the, the fire exploding, just kind of like a uh, aerosol can in a fire. The fire spread very quickly. The island was small, 
with a population of less than a thousand, and the fire truck's engine was in the process of being repaired. That's not good. As Jones stood there watching the blaze, his best friend, who'd re-entered the restaurant through a side door to use the bathroom while Jones was inside, ran out of the building, his entire body engulfed in flames. He died. And that has to have its own bit of trauma to it, too. In the middle of the street, a few feet from Jones. Jones later learned that his friend had been listening to loud music in the bathroom. And, of course, he had no idea what Jones was planning. His friend's headphones ended up burned into his head while Jones stood there. That's kind of grisly to be, you know, to put it mildly. Staring, unable to look away. A minute or so later, the gas station connected to the restaurant went up in flames, followed quickly by the post office beside it. At this point, Jones finally turned and ran home as fast as he could. Yeah, um, I don't know if he kind of just like regained his mind and realized what he'd done and needed to get out of there or if it's just some primal instinct survival skill that got him out of there. But like my memory of the swimming pool, when Jones made it back home and told his parents what had happened, they didn't believe him. They took him back to the restaurant to show him and they were right. Everything was fine. Except everything didn't feel fine to Jones. Now, the, that, that would, I don't know, that would kind of weird me out a whole lot for something like that to happen for an event like the swimming pool event she described in earlier episodes and this event. If you notice, both events deal with fire. So, you know. He was so distraught that they had to have him sedated. And eventually, a few weeks later, when he wouldn't stop raving, they had him admitted to an institution for observation. Even though it looked like nothing had actually happened, arson or murder-wise, Jones's friend never visited Jones in the mental facility. In fact, after the night Jones imagined the fire, his best friend never spoke with him again. Yeah, it actually does sound like Jones and I have a lot in common. It's kind of creepy that, you know, even if you take, if you accept the fact that Jones slipped dimensions, and in one dimension he did burn down the town. Then you come to this other dimension and your best friend won't talk to you. That's kind of weird. It would weird me out. We spoke a bit more about his family. But in case you haven't guessed, he asked that I didn't record that part of our conversation. He did allow me to turn on my voice recorder once I kind of changed the subject. Oh, and his parents never did split up. Interesting. What else can you tell me about our parents and your multiple dimensional Gatewick world hopping theory? Why do we remember things they don't? Well, at first I thought my parents were lying to me. Yeah, I felt that way too. When I was older, I wondered if I'd experienced some kind of weird echo or pocket of weirdness. But you don't think that's it? No. See, I've experienced, for lack of a better term, pockets of weirdness. 
then when I've been able to distance myself from it and look at it rationally, it's not so weird. But in the context of this podcast, it can, I mean, those things can become really weird really fast. All right, so stay with me. This is going to get a bit out there. Oh, I think we're already way out there. Probably way past way out there. Okay. So, what if, in cases of extreme stress or duress, the offspring of the participants from Gatewick Institute Research subproject R7 are able to slip into another version of reality. Identical in every aspect other than the event that caused them distress. The world remains the same for everyone around them. The only thing different is the source of the stress is gone. Erased. Now that is interesting because from th- things I've read and research I've done with like um, LSD, lysergic acid diethamide, and psilocybin, the hallucinations that you have because of the nature of these chemicals, your brain will record them as actual memories. And for some people, the experience of the uh, of taking these particular chemicals into your body will that memory this hallucination or whatever as your brain has recorded it as a real memory five six seven twenty years down the road whatever that something jogs that memory and you remember it is real and that that is some of the 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 trouble with these two particular chemicals outside of say a professional mental health specialist clinic that if you're not prepared or if you were like just dumb college kid or whatever you did these drugs and you only did it one time then you know you leave college you have a career you get married family then one day boom something triggers that memory and it's all over because you've done forgot about it then all of a sudden you get this very vivid memory that your brain is telling you really happened. So, you know, that's, I find that, that kind of parallel too in this, so. That sounds interesting, scary, and extremely improbable. That's what I thought at first. And it's also scientifically impossible. Yeah, but not theoretically, scientifically impossible. Multiple worlds theory? Among other quantum theories, yes, but what if there was a a trigger? Now, that I wonder. If we accept... Okay, let's... Let's accept that this world-slipping thing happens. Let's accept it as an axiom. And whatever the trigger is, stress, I just wonder if a stressful experience that isn't necessarily bad, but say first time having sex with somebody you always wanted to have sex with or something like that, something pleasurable. I wonder if that would trigger, if that could trigger it too. If I mean, because you, 
you build up that anticipation, you build up that, oh my God, am I going to be good enough or whatever. I just wonder how that works or if it, you know, or if it's only negative stress. Something that activated this ability. What was subproject R7? It was one of the programs our parents were involved in. The MK Ultra type thing? One of them, yes. I'm going to tell you about a dream I've been experiencing consistently ever since I was a kid. Does this have anything to do with that dream Alan Scarpio mentioned? That could be a lot of different things. And it's as we get closer to the end of the season, it's harder for me to make comment without spoilage. So it's you know, it's one of those things where it's going to be these one or two word, maybe little diatrods and stuff. But it's really difficult to, to do it without spoiling. Yes. Tell me. Okay. It starts off on a beach. A lonely gray day overcast. The waves are rolling in, loud and powerful. I'm looking across the water. It's cool outside, not exactly cold, but definitely not tropical. I hear the sound of wings beating from above, and I turn to see an eagle. But as it moves closer, I realize it's not an eagle. It's a giant raven. This thing is huge. It screeches out a gnarled caw and flies off above the endless dense forest that runs parallel to the beach. And I can see a giant raven being traumatic, especially in a dream, because I have on my property, I have a small group of homesteaded ravens and a regular sized raven is pretty damn big compared to its uh, crow and grackle relatives I mean they're a huge bird um, so yeah it's I mean then again ravens go out of their way to do their best to delete as many eagles and hawks off the planet as they can. I mean, they're, just, they're a ferocious bird. Both the beach and the dark green forest appear to go on forever. After a moment, I turn and follow the giant bird. I can't help myself, and although it feels extremely dangerous, I turn and walk straight into the thick green forest. Jones. Stay with me. I walk for quite a while before I come to a small clearing. There is a polished concrete structure standing there, in the center. It has some kind of sliding metal door, and next to the door, a small silver button. I approach the structure slowly, carefully, taking the time to walk all the way around. See, just because of my nature, I'm not real sure that I'd take the time to walk around. I think I'd just run off blindly into the structure. But, you know, that's just my personality. And the Jones character in this is probably doing the right thing. More than likely doing the right and sane thing at this point during the dream examining every inch of the thing. But it appears to be nothing more than a five by five polished stone structure with a sliding door. So, I press the button. There's a distant click followed by a whirring sound and then a few seconds later, the sliding door opens. I step into a small metal room. It's cold inside and cross my arms to try to stay warm. The sliding door closes and a light flickers from above. 
then, something happens. We start to move. Yes. Notice how she said, we start to move. It's an elevator. Yes. Who told you about this? I told you. It's a reoccurring dream. That's impossible. The beach, the bird, the forest, the concrete structure, the elevator, everything. It's my dream. Yeah, that's the, this is, it's starting to get fairly deep here. No. It's our dream. See, now what makes me wonder when Scorpio mentioned in the last episode about the, uh, the dream if everyone that plays rabbits or everyone who's drawn to the rabbits game has that dream or a variant thereof of that dream hey everyone my name is terry miles okay we got the uh, in video or in thing uh, advertisement and we're going to try to skip past that real quick. Novel. I love creating podcasts and making movies. And I was just wondering how the uh, how this is all coming together. I, I really, I'm really not wondering because I know, but it's trying to get the things in without spoiling it. That's the hard part. So I keep forgetting about these commercials coming in, especially on these longer issue, longer episodes. Here we go. We're back to the show or the episode, podcast, whatever. Jones had a recurring dream he's had ever since he was a child. A dream about a beach, a forest, and an elevator. I've had the same dream hundreds of times ever since I was a kid. Every physical detail and each emotional response was exactly the same. I told my parents, my brother, and Yumiko about the dream, but I never told anyone else. I'm gonna go ahead and call this good at this point. And I hope everyone out there in the world is being safe, having fun, trials and tribulations to a minimum and until next time peace hey it's 10 p.m do you know where your children are